Well, hello there. This is John with Graco.dev. Wanted to talk with you all about vector databases, what you should use them for, and which one you should pick. So, I found this helpful article on Hacker News recently and thought it was about as good of a summary as any that I've seen written up. Just about anywhere. I'm not going to claim that every single detail is correct, but I think it's correct enough for our purposes. So first off, uh, let's talk about what a vector, vector database is and exactly why you'd want to use one. So more and more, vectors as a data type are becoming important, uh, particularly for AI and ML applications. And so first off, what is a vector? Just basically a list of numbers, right? Um, if you want to be technical about it, vectors are a list of numbers that you can interpret as a magnitude. Um, and by combining vectors or computing the difference between them, you can get an understanding for how one set of numbers differs from another. Um, and so that's pretty abstract, so let's make that a little bit more clear. Um, if you're looking at something like a large language model in an LLM, somehow that model has to figure out the semantics of a piece of text or another piece of media. Uh, semantics meaning the, the meaning of the, the content. And the, the way that those things work typically at a high level is you take a the set of words in a sentence or a piece of text and you compute the overlap between the words in that text and the other set of words. So you can kind of visualize it like a matrix, right? So along one axis, you have, let's say, every word in the English language. And on the other axis, you have every other word in the English language. Um, and so you could take a, a comparison, um, let's see, like a, a monkey and chimpanzee would probably have a high degree of similarity. A monkey and banana would probably have a lower, but still not zero degree of similarity. Um, and something like monkey and dog, uh, lower, but still not zero. And, you know, monkey and water or monkey and headphones or something like that might be just about zero. Um, and so you can start to compute the, the overlap in meaning semantics between every word and every other word. Um, it ends up looking like a giant matrix. And that way you can take a potentially very long piece of text and compress it down into a comparatively small or sparse a uh, vector, just quite literally a list of numbers. And that list represents the meaning of whatever it is that you passed in. And so you can take something that might be about, uh, you know, George the uh, the chimp and his banana and get an understanding exactly in a mathematical sense of what that text means. And so what's really cool about that is once you have numbers to describe what it is that you're talking about, you can start quite literally doing math. And so you can say, well, okay, I have a vector over here. It's easiest to visualize in 2D space, and I probably should have done a diagram, but whatever, it's kind of a stream of consciousness video. So you can imagine um, vectors in 2D space. You have an x-axis and a y-axis like normal, right? And you could imagine that um, on one axis, you have the, let's say, the monkeyness of a thing. And on the other axis, you have the, what was the example I used? The headphonesness of the thing, right? And so those two things, um, you can plot theoretically any piece of text or any word, and we only have two dimensions, so it's probably going to be a word, um, and get an idea of exactly, okay, this particular point represents how monkey something is and how headphones something is, right? Now, what's really cool about that is that once you have your vector, in this case, it's just going to be two numbers for each vector, right? Um, but you can actually do math to understand how alike or different those things are. And you quite literally plot the lines in 2D space in that case, because we only have the two numbers. And you can measure exactly how, how close those things are in meaning. And that is fundamentally how LLMs work. Of course, they're like very, very like much more complex, but uh, in, intuition wise, that's kind of how they, they work. Um, and there's some details there around how they come up with those overlaps. Like you can kind of guess it as a human, like how alike are these two words? Um, but in the case of uh, LLM, they have some you know sophisticated algorithms that look at how often uh, two words occur in the same corpus and how close together they are in the corpus. And of course, that works particularly well when your model is fundamentally predicting the next token in a sequence of tokens. So anyway, um, I should probably do another video at some point about the, the mechanics of how LLMs work, because I find it fascinating personally. But the, the point of that is just to express that vectors are a very important primitive for representing anything that you want to do in, in that realm, right? Um, and it's not just for LLMs either. So once you have a way to mathematically represent a something as a vector, the meaning of something as a vector, um, then you can do all sorts of cool stuff, right? So if I can understand semantically um, this particular sentence, 
uh, that becomes very relevant for search all of a sudden. So all I have to do is take my favorite uh, metric for measuring uh, difference between vectors. And I can say, well, this is your search term. I compute the embedding. So embeddings are basically the vectors. And from that embedding, I can then compare it to everything that I know about in terms of maybe content um, or in the case of a search engine that would be particularly relevant. Or um, you can imagine a help desk application where I want to surface content that I have pre-written. Um, or sometimes they'll combine an LLM with something like that. So you could imagine that um, they'll find the top three answers in your knowledge base and then use those as context for prompting an LLM response that you can interact with, right? And so being able to measure um, the, the vector distance between vectors that you know about, which could be things in your database, your, your knowledge base, and whatever it is the user is searching for is something very powerful. And so um, at some point, some people realize, okay, look, this is a powerful thing. Obviously, like you can represent a list of numbers and have been able to do that for a long time in databases, but they were not particularly optimized for that use case. And so that's how we end up with vector databases is they are particularly optimized for these kinds of operations where you want to store a potentially large list of numbers and be able to query them for things like distance, finding the nearest neighbors, uh, k-means clustering, like all sorts of cool stuff like that, right? So um, that's kind of the background on this stuff. So now we can get to the, the fun stuff, which is comparing vendors. And so um, if you look at the landscape today, there are a bunch of people who've been in the space longer than others. Some of them are open source, self-hostable. Some of them are not. Um, I think Pinecone was one of the first to, to the scene. Uh, regrettably, that one is not open source or self-hosted. And largely for that reason, I haven't really played with it too much. Um, but I think stepping back for a second, the, the biggest ingredient here to consider, as always, is, is what is your use case, right? So um, the, the options here, and actually, I mean, this is a good comparison, but it doesn't have everything. So I would add Redis to this list because uh, it certainly belongs here as well and has some good traction from, from companies. And then also PlanetScale just announced that they're doing uh, vectors as well. And so um, as always, you need to like work backwards from what your use case is and then figure out what the best option is. So I think the ingredients here to look at in no particular order, um, latency is an important thing to consider. So basically, if I want to do a search, um, how fast can I get results back, right? And that's where an in-memory solution, uh, for example, Redis or some of the other things on this list, are, are going to be particularly helpful, right? Um, on the other hand, maybe you care a lot about not being locked into a vendor, in which case an open source self-hostable solution, something like PG Vector, um, would actually be very good, right? Um, also, the size of the team, I think, is an ingredient too. Uh, one of the things that's attractive about PG Vector in particular is that if you happen to be using Postgres for all of your relational needs, regardless, it is one less moving part, one less piece of infrastructure that you have to manage. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Um, I think usually the trade-off is that the performance of a, what's called a purpose-built solution, is usually going to be a little bit faster or whatever. But, you know, Postgres can kind of be the Swiss army knife of, well, just about everything. And so the benefit is that if you're a small team, then, you know, you don't have to pick off so many tools to, to get your job done. Right. So anyway, um, it's kind of interesting to, to look over this list. And let's just go through it real fast. So Pinecone, I would argue, is probably one of the more famous solutions in the vector database space. Like I said, I don't have any experience with using this personally in production. Um, and it is not an open source or self-hosted product, which is the, the kind of thing that I tend to shy away from, right? So um, for me, this is kind of a non-starter, right? But uh, to, to be fair, uh, the thing that I consistently hear about Pinecone is exactly how low the, the latency is. Like you're going to get um, sort of like Redis levels of performance out of it, at least in that respect, right? So um, that is uh, an impressive thing. At the same time, like the, the fact that it's proprietary for me anyway, is just kind of a non-starter. Um, Weviate and Milvis, um, again, I'm relatively new to this space. For context, I've been working on uh, this product that I've been working on that's in this space for, you know, like three weeks, something like that. So, you know, I don't claim to be that much of an expert, but uh, Milvis has a reputation for uh, a lot of speed which is great, very low latency. And of course the query uh, throughput is quite high as well. Um, I'm actually quite interested in this simply because it's also open source and self-hostable and that matters a lot for me as well. Um, so I don't really claim to know what they mean here about the developer experience being super good or super bad, uh, whatever, but you know, it's, uh, it's something to think about. And uh, also worth mentioning is I think pretty much all of these, almost all of them have some sort of uh, cloud option that you can opt into as well, right? So, um, Milvis is high on my list of things to try at some point if I ever need the performance. Um, 
quadrant as well. Um, but really, like in my case, I do tend to lean towards solutions that are a little bit more battle tested um, and also have more of that sort of open source and community uh, background. And so Elasticsearch uh, does not fit the open source bill. It does have a long history. Um, honestly, PG Vector is where I knitted out on my last project. And so my reasoning for that was, uh, look, we're a two-man team. Um, we're actually just in the customer development stage, prototyping, trying to get something in front of customers so that we can get as much feedback as possible. Um, if you've ever like built a, a product from scratch before, um, of course, speed to implementation is a really important factor. Uh, but a, actually, a big ingredient for speed of implementation is also just having fewer moving parts that you have to worry about. And so we were actually able to get that down to a, a real, real minimum, right? So we have a Python backend, obviously, because we're doing AI and ML stuff. We have an XJS frontend, um, just because it was the easiest to work with and had a lot of packages for the stuff that we wanted to do. Um, and then we have a service called Modal, which I'll probably make a video about, that is running all of our Python background tasks, kind of as a replacement for Celery, but more importantly, has a bunch of AI ML stuff in the cloud. It's actually really cool how it works. You just wrap your code in some annotations. And the fact that it ends up running on their hardware in their cloud actually ends up feeling more like an implementation detail. It's just kind of your code lives in your code. Um, so yeah, that's all pretty cool. But anyway, so we landed on PG Vector for a lot of the reasons that are here. Why? I mean, it's Postgres. It's a community-driven project. I mean, it kind of checked all of our boxes, right? So like the nature of what we're doing, by the way, is like latency is actually, this may not apply to you. Latency is just a complete non-factor for us. I mean, as long as it's reasonable, right? Like the difference between 2,400 queries per second and 141 for our purposes is negligible. And the reason for that is um, it's essentially batch jobs that run in the background. So for the particular, I'm not going to go into the case that we're targeting right now because it's still early and it might change, but I will do videos on it at some point if we stick with it, which uh, I promise. But um, in any case, if the customer is fine with stuff taking minutes to come back, the difference between this and this is really not material. And the savings, I mean, in all senses, is, is pretty cool, right? Like we have one system that we have to worry about, uh, at least as far as a data store, and it could do everything. It have, handles all of our relational stuff, it handles uh, vector operations and all of that. And I can tell you firsthand, having worked with uh, PG Vector now, it's actually pretty slick. I mean, I, I don't really have enough of context in the space to tell you if it's literally the best out there. Uh, but it was not difficult to work with. I'll put it that way. I mean, wired up to SQL Alchemy with a uh, vector column and you're done. I could even show you guys some some code, but not really prepared at the time of this recording. So I'll, I'll table that for a future video, let's say. But um, anyway, the, the other ingredient here, or I keep saying ingredient, the other option here uh, is Redis. And I'm really not sure why they didn't include it in this list, because I actually think it's being used in prod uh, by quite a few impressive companies. So Redis has good vector support. Um, and of course the latency on Redis, because if you're not aware, so Redis is uh, an entirely in memory database and that's why it's so freaking fast. So the trade-off there has historically has been that, um, Postgres is sort of on the extreme end of acid guarantees, meaning that your data is, the priority is on consistency and durability and making sure that you don't lose data. Right. And so the, the trade-off has been that Postgres is willing to accept somewhat slower performance. It's not a slow database by any means, but you know, things like consistency carry a, a cost intrinsically. Uh, Redis, on the other hand, even though actually it is more durable than people think it is, their focus has always been on, hey, look, just put stuff in here. We're a key value store. And the whole point is we can keep all of those key values in memory so that you can access them really fast. And so where it's historically been super useful is stuff like search results and, and things like that. But Redis, I think relatively recently, added vector operations as well. And so we're so early right now that we're not using Redis for anything, but I could definitely see a future where if we needed to add Redis for caching, uh, I could definitely see us migrating some of our vector operations with that too. Like fundamentally, Postgres is probably gonna be the source of truth as far as keeping your source data so that you can compute your embeddings and then run your vector operations on top of that. And Redis would be a per perfectly fine choice for that. In our case, we didn't need Redis in our stack yet. So there, there was a cost to adding another piece of infrastructure. So in our case, PG Vector made a ton of sense. Um, but that was how we evaluated the decision. On the other hand, right, if I were going to go and build a very latency sensitive app, then yeah, I might consider Redis or I might consider some of the other things on this list. Um, so I think that's basically the trade-off. Um, my, my personal opinion is just stay away from stuff that's closed source. Um, that being said, I mean, you could argue that to the extent that embeddings are downstream data that you're computing from stuff that you're storing elsewhere in your database, 
maybe it's not so vendor lock-in. Like I would worry a lot more about using a a lockdown relational database for you. Because I mean, database migrations are so painful. Anybody who's ever done one will tell you that. Um, but yeah, in any case, if you have the option to use something that's open source and you could theoretically host on your own infra if you needed to, I say just do it. You know, like don't lock yourself into something that uh, might screw you down the road. And shitification is real. So anyway, uh, those are my thoughts on the matter. Um, other things that we could talk about, but I think are a little bit premature. Uh, SQLite actually has a package for doing uh, vector search as well. I mean, it has some limitations. Uh, I think the the largest it can hold in a column is one gigabyte, which might be fine for your use case. Um, but if that is uh, too much of a limitation um, or just SQLite's trade-offs are not working for your app, then of course, maybe that's not the best choice. But um, you know, the, the analysis there would be uh, very similar to Postgres in the sense of, well, if you wanted to use SQLite anyway, but you also need vector support, I mean, it is there for you, right? Perhaps not at the maturity level of something like PG Vector, which itself is maybe not super mature, but so is everything on this list. It's not super mature, right? So anyway, uh, those are my thoughts on the matter. I hope this is helpful for understanding why you would want a better fact vector database um, and how you might choose one. Um, any questions, comments, anything I left out, or if you have any interesting options that I should cover, uh, leave it in the comments below. I will see you guys next time. Hasta luego.